Hello and welcome to the first annual Monopoly Championship. I'm Chet Chetberg. And I'm Dick Williams. How are you doing today, Dick? I'm doing very well. All right, we have an exciting matchup today between Rob and Ivan. It's going to be a Hellraiser. Okay, let's pause this right here. This is a story about my friend Rob. That's me and him in high school. You see, I'm the cliché. The nerdy kid who watched Jurassic Park way too many times as a kid and had the ill-conceived idea that he could suddenly be the next Spielberg. And with all my bad writing and grainy, shaky camera work, Rob was there, every time, supporting me. You see, like I said, this story isn't about me, it's about him. Once we graduated, I figured that we would be famous, making amazing films for all to see. We would be unstoppable. Times change. Hey, how you doing? It's great to be here tonight. He just had a great character about him, just a great personality. Rob was one of those guys that just stood out to all of us and just had a just, just explosive personality. He's goofy. He's outgoing as all. I've never met anybody quite as outgoing as him. He's got these quirks about him that are just very consistent. Everything, everything had 100% in it. He brought such like a a charisma to the whole unit. He was always up at 8 a.m., you know, always like ready, never missed breakfast. Everyone's dead tired, he never missed breakfast. He's a great guy, he's just real fun and down to earth, really. And like a group of people, everyone sort of looks towards him, like for the, the fun and the party. He's always like constantly like working out, and always like pushing everybody that he's around to be be better. He never got mad, you know, he never got pissed. He never, he always volunteered to do stuff. And uh, everyone kind of looked at him and was like, where do you get this energy from? Where do you get this optimism from? Recently had some elections. Uh, Republicans took back the House of Representatives. But, uh, you know, we're still seeing a lot of election stickers around, even though the election's over. These uh, stickers seem to stick around for a long time. I could have sworn the other day I saw Vote Washington 1776. <laughs> Oh, it was July 22nd of 2010. We were at Fab Brinkerman in the Sangin district of Afghanistan in Helmand province. So I was with a squad and I was basically clearing a path for them and I stepped on or I got hit by an IED. I'm not sure what kind it was. The first thing you hear the boom, you see the flash and everything. And then the next thing you hear is you hear him cry out in pain. The second thing I heard him is, you know, if I've lost anything special, um, you know, shoot me. And then the guys tell him he hasn't lost his, uh, his uh, private parts, and, uh, and then bam, he's good. I was pretty much right on top of it, and it took my left leg and my right leg. I collected his uh, leg, and I thought he had lost a whole lot more because when I picked up his leg, you know, in my mind's eye, I'm seeing his knee down. And of course, I, I probably was looking at upper shin down. Sometimes I feel like I probably should have seen it. Or sometimes I feel like maybe I rushed myself. And I should have seen, you know, an indicator or something. He was coherent. I mean, he had morphine in his system. The company commander came up to us and he told us that two of our guys had gotten hit. Um, one of them's name was Jones, and then we came to find out later that the other one's name was Jones, and we didn't know which one was uh, hit and how bad e either of them were. We heard pretty bad stories. The reports originally came back that Jones RR was a double amputee, which usually, you know, is assumed to be legs, and then it was reported that Jones DD was a triple amputee, and then there's a lot of mix-up because they both are last name Jones from the same unit. We were in Sangin, Afghanistan, and we were waiting to cross a river. They called for seven volunteers to go out there and I was one of the ones who went out there and we were just, we we're setting up in a tree line and just to keep eyes on and uh, that's when I got hit. We thought it was a mortar that had 
that they were shooting at us. So uh, we just started walking back quicker. And then uh, right as we got to uh, about 25 meters from our truck, they started pulling stretchers out. I don't really know much else about it. I haven't really gone through the necessary paperwork to find out the details, but I got blown up and that's all I really need to know, I guess. I didn't even recognize him at first, you know, the mud and dirt blood all over his face. It wasn't until like five, ten minutes later we realized that it was actually Dan. Rob and Daniel are both really athletic, really into working out like Jim Jones. They would both go to the gym together and so they would call themselves Jim Jones and uh, I mean grueling workouts. I met them and it was like kind of like a package deal. Very good friends. They uh, inseparable at times. If you're if you're getting made fun of by one of them then they just sit there and, and you know feed off each other and make it and just escalate it, escalate it, escalate it. One thing about Dee Dee and Rob is they're both always reading books, always interested in learning new things, you know, that's outside their scope of stuff that they're used to. When we were in ICU we were almost right across the hall from each other. I think that's really when it, it hit me that it, he had actually been hurt. Hey bud, I'm still down here in intensive care. Just wanted to say hi. Love you, miss you. I can't wait to get up to the fifth floor and hang out. It'll be good times. We'll work on a fucking workout plan. Take care, buddy. I'll see you soon. Bye. Three. Go ahead. You gotta hold it closer. All right, all right. Cause I don't have a very good that's, voice. That's, he could hear you. Hey man, uh, first things first, we gotta design a, a workout program to get on our feet again. <laughs> and then we gotta have a really good time up here. I can't wait to see you. And uh, I'm thinking about you. Peace. If there's any good that came out of it, it, it was the fact that, you know, yeah, it was nice to have someone there, you know, that was going through something like you were so you could talk. I think it made me stronger because I had to be tougher because he was there. When he would come in my room and stuff, that always made me feel better. There was uh, recently, there was a tornado, unfortunately, in the Midwest and actually ended up killing eight people. Um, but luckily the tornado was apprehended by police um, and it was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences in the stratosphere with no chance of water vapor. So it was a good ending to that story. I joined the Marine Corps in 2006 on my junior year of college at Virginia Tech and then I went back and finished my last year because I was a reservist. My job as a combat engineer is to find IEDs in any in any situation our job was you know looking for explosives and blowing them up and so it's rob me a couple guys and and we're out there and and we find some some weapon caches and there's tons of stuff we're digging up stuff all day you know exhausted you know don't get any sleep that night you know a couple third day goes by and and we're just like done i don't want to see a shovel i don't want to pick up another hundred pound munition you know, I'm tired, I want to go home and get some chow and get some water, I'm dirty, I haven't showered. And Rob was the only one that was like, no, let's keep looking, there's more, there's, you know, let's, and he just, you know, everyone you know, is like, let's, let's take a break. And he was like, grab the shovel, grab, you know, his rifle, grab his gear, and I'm going out looking for more, you know. And he found more stuff, and he, he always had that personality, just to keep driving, keep pushing, in, in such an optimistic way, you know. He never got down about anything, and he, he really kind of, you know, inspired the whole unit with his personality. He was the reason why I made it back. If there was anybody that was diligent and followed the procedures, went step by step, and never sped it up, that was him. We still don't know exactly what it was that he had stepped on, but there's no doubt in my mind that it was one of the hardest IEDs that could be found, if found at all. When I thought of joining the military, I didn't want to join anything but the Marine Corps. I was just take it in by the camaraderie and pretty much everything that the Marine Corps stood for. Well, I guess I kind of always wanted to be a Marine. I'm not exactly sure why. The main thing that attracted me to the Marines was just the brotherhood. I think I wanted to join because I wanted to build up something. I wanted to go fight. And, and there's this saying, you know, uh, a true soldier doesn't, uh, doesn't fight for what he hates in front of him, but because of what he loves that he left behind. And he meets so many great guys and, and you know, Rob, really personified that more than anyone I've ever known. The people that I was over there with, I mean, you, you just become so close with them and every second of every day is is with them. So you have no choice but to, to bond with them and, and get along. But then you come back here and it, it's just so much easier to have someone that's gone through the the same type of things as, uh, as, as you went through. I just felt like as long as there were Marines somewhere, 
fighting that I should be over there with them because I didn't join the Marine Corps to just stay in the States. I joined the Marine Corps to do the fighting. And I really like the aspects of the Brotherhood of the Marine Corps. That's been really prominent in the friendships that I've made uh, in the Marine Corps with other Marines is that I know that I can always depend on them and they can depend on me. Like I would hop out of this wheelchair in a second if I had to for a buddy, you know, if they got in a fight or something. I'd vault out. I don't know how I do it, but somehow I'm really close to the people I went to Iraq with just because we spent so much time together and we went through all these different experiences together. That's also what Corporal Jones showed me is that, you know, we were the family and we were continuing all of this. We got the phone calls from our friends saying, hey, got some bad news, you know, Rob got hurt. We all took off work, we drove down to Bethesda, we, we met up with his family. Immediately though, you know, even though he was drugged up on morphine, kind of out of it, you could still see he had the his same personality, he was still with it, he was still joking around. For being as drugged up as he was, he was, you know, still Jones. That was kind of the first time we thought to ourselves, you know, thank God he's, he's all right, he's still the same guy. It was really bad at first. I couldn't sleep at all because I had nightmares constantly whenever I closed my eyes. A normal person, when they close their eyes, it gets dark. But for me, it would be like, uh, it'd be like I was watching a movie and the movie was either some weird hallucination or some kind of a nightmare. For a split second, I would relive the blast and I, would, I, could, see, I could see my legs like splattered all over the ground. Sometimes I would hallucinate really bad stuff like I was like I would be going out on patrol and I got shot so the patrol was going out with me without me and I was stuck back at the fob and another time I dreamed that I got hit by a mortar and for some reason my mom was with me and it just really hurt and I could see like blood all over the place so those were really the worst times he was laying down in his bed and we were standing up around him just trying to talk with them and he was in and out of it, really drugged up. There was like maybe five guys here and he's telling us about what he's seeing and the, the morphine kind of making him, you know, visualize a couple things. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I just, I'm fighting off these aliens right now. They're just walking around and now they're zombies. And, and he looks up and he sees, he looks at me and my friends. He's like, oh, you're Rego, great, you guys are here too. He's like, well, uh, uh oh, you're, you're falling through the ground. You're, you guys are sinking through the mud. And he's like, bye guys, bye. Good luck with that. And then you, you get quiet for a minute. And you come back, he's like, I just got back from Japan, you know? <laughs> so he, he still had a good sense of humor. I wanted to get a, a funny hat for my mom uh, because I thought that if I was wearing a funny hat the first time she saw me, it would take the edge off a little bit, you know? She would see, you know, my legs and she would see the funny hat and she wouldn't be able to help but laugh and put herself in a good mood. But uh, they weren't able to find one. And when I got to Bethesda, there's my mom with a pirate hat in her hand. So somehow they found out that I asked for a funny hat and she brought me one. It's really hard to accept at first, but you know, it's, you take what caused you to be like that and you realize you know it's kind of understandable that you know you have to get so much help so the first thing they did was close my left leg I had some serious wounds to my rear end which were still open they were really deep so I would go into surgery pretty much every other day they closed up all my wounds, and then we waited five days to make sure the skin graft took, and then they checked the skin graft, they saw it was good, the next day I got transferred to Walter Reed, because that's the place you go for prosthetics. You get these little things called stubbies, and they're, they're about this, this tall, they're just straight bars, and you're on those for a while because obviously you're, you're relearning how to walk, so you want to keep your center, center of gravity low. And then they heighten you a little bit, and it's still the straight, the straight bar. They change the foot that's on it. They change it to a foot that flexes, so it's like you have an ankle almost. 
And then after you've mastered that, you graduate to the full height, then you have some you have a knee. The first type of leg you learn is the C leg, which is a computerized leg and it has sensors for pressure. And then after you've mastered the C leg, you get a mechanical leg, which works on your own power. And after that, you just come in until you're ready to get discharged. Now, there's a difference between phantom sensation and then there's phantom pain. Phantom sensation is when you just feel your limbs that aren't there anymore. Uh, and phantom pain is when they actually hurt. Your brain's confused, like, it thinks that your limbs are still there, but they're not, and your synapses, like, misfire and stuff. And that's why you feel it. You know how sometimes when you go to sleep and you accidentally go like this with your arm, and it ends up flopping down and you can't feel it? It's like, uh, imagine trying to move your fingers like that. You can, uh, you can imagine that your arm is there, and that your fingers are there and you're trying to move them but they won't move no matter how hard you try the whole thing hasn't really been all that difficult I'm kinda of just going through it you know he would have humor at all times I mean if, if a guy can laugh when his legs are blown off you know there's something special about him when he found out they had Mountain Dew over in Iraq he was ecstatic, you know, so that theme sort of stays with him. And even up when the president gave him his Purple Heart in Bethesda, he asked President Barack Obama to do the do with him. When we were in Musa Kela the first time with Weapons Company and uh, Kilo Company, we were all out in the middle of nowhere. We, we didn't have a whole lot of food and stuff, and everybody was getting sick. You could really couldn't go five minutes in the one compound with, without somebody without hearing like Bleh! and I remember Rob was so happy because he hadn't gotten sick yet and his whole platoon he was with and I saw him the next day and he just looked like crap but he was so proud they hadn't puked yet I didn't get I didn't puke though I am very proud of that fact I hate having to have people take care of me and stuff I like to be the one that's taking care of other people instead it's okay. a real pleasure to meet you man. it's a pleasure to meet you what happened uh IED yeah I'm, I'm a combat engineer, so it's my job to find them. And uh, I was just, I was looking for one at the time. And, you know, I found it, but found it in the worst way possible. It blew up on me, so. But I talked to my physical therapist and I told her uh, the Marine Corps birthday is November 10th. And I want to be walking by then. And I told her I'd do whatever I had to do. I'd come down two, three times a day. You know, I did whatever she said I had to do in order to be walking by November 10th. His goal was, was getting to you know, the Marine Corps ball in November and being able to stand up and dance and do this whole scene where he goes up in his wheelchair and he like, you know, stands up and starts walking. And he talked about that every day and he did it. You know, and that was amazing to see that in such a short amount of time. There's like the therapy world, which is where I am now, and then there's the the real world. And the therapy world is very flat, and everybody knows the plight that you're in, so they can kind of lend a hand when you need it. But then there's the real world where there's all sorts of hills that I have to go up and down. Uh, there isn't always a railing when I need one. I have to get a specially adapted car. That's become more obvious to me now versus, you know, before when I didn't have any kind of disability. It is an honor for me to be out here today to celebrate Veterans Day at my old high school. Believe it or not, my first thoughts upon waking after the blast did not reflect worry about dying. Somehow I knew that I would survive. Instead, I pictured the rest of my life without legs and realized that I would have to give up some of the plans I had made and some of the things I loved doing. Somehow, despite all this, I managed to maintain a positive attitude. And now that I have seen and heard about the amazing things that prosthetics can accomplish, I know that I do not actually have to give up on those plans. Thank you for having me here today, and I hope you have a wonderful Veterans Day. Thank you. All right, let's get serious.
really think it's his positive attitude, his positive outlook on everything. He realizes you can't go back and change it, so make the best of it. When he first got in his wheelchair, he started learning to do tricks on it, like spinning around and things like that. He's one of those people, you could sit there and you could say caring and nice and passionate and all this other stuff that you say about normal people, but I think everybody knows he's not normal. He's, you know, he's better than that. He's incredible. His dreams may have just changed a little bit, but he's still going for it. I mean, he's just a cool dude. Since I left Walter Reed inpatient, I moved out to what's called the Malone House, the outpatient housing for all the outpatients that they have here. Basically, I've just been going through the normal progression of the prosthetics. I've pretty much returned to as much a sense of normalcy as I was before, but I don't think I'll be completely normal until I get out of the hospital, I get a job, and, you know, I kind of put all this behind me. I have a, an internship with the FBI in the works. Once I get discharged, hopefully they'll make me a job offer, and ideally I will be able to become a special agent after getting myself in shape for the physical fitness test. Still taking it to the bad guys even though I don't have any legs anymore. Near the end of the year I am planning to attempt a cross-country bike trip, so hopefully I'll be able to do that. And I would like to get into uh, maybe some kind of a, a Paralympic sport, like rowing. I'm, I'm kind of looking at rowing, maybe the biathlon. I had to start with the baseline of having a great attitude and having a solid, just having a solid attitude to, to start from. But now that all my friends and all my family have seen me with that great attitude, I can't do anything. I can't change that because it'll let them down. And every time I ever start to feel, you know, start to feel down about my situation or start to feel sorry for myself, I remember that I have to maintain this, this attitude. So it's really them forcing me to stay positive rather than me just coming up with some kind of inner strength to, uh, to stay positive throughout the whole process. I recently uh, put in an application for, for a social security disability. Got denied. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Learned a lot about myself, a lot about perseverance. You have to keep going whether or not uh, your circumstances are uh, ideal. It's uh, just the way things are, so you just kind of got to go with it, you know? He's never going to give up, and he's going to be successful no matter what you take away from him or throw at him. You know, he's going to keep on driving. Yeah, everyone's like, oh, he's so strong, blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah, that's just Jones. He just doesn't let stuff get to him. Obviously, this has changed a lot of things for him, but he's not letting this stop him from doing things he wants to do. He kind of hits a wall and will go and climb over it. He, like I said, if Rob wants to do something, he'll do it. No matter how much it affects him, he doesn't show it at all. His willpower is just amazing. You know, obviously, it really sucks that I lost my legs, you know. Uh, that's something I'm never going to have back, and my life's going to be different uh, from here on out. So, you know, that really sucks. But, uh, you know, I can't dwell on that too much because there's nothing I can do to change it now. What amazes me most about Rob is what he represents. That in the wake of something awful, the only thing you really can do is keep on going. It's not some momentous thing of courage that occurs in a movie's third act, backed with swelling strings and a vibrant horn section. Really, it's just existing. It's accepting. Shortly after Rob got his senses back and he started the recovery process in Bethesda, he said it all very succinctly. Survive, recover, live. Nothing to see here. Time to move on. Time to keep going. It is often said that hindsight is 2020. The only way you can really understand life is by looking at it backwards. But I have to argue that really, Life is understood both ways, both forward and backward. Without the surprises and the unexpected, 
the good and bad, life lacks flavor. It lacks heart. For if you know how your journey is going to end, if you know the punchline of the joke, really, there's no reason to laugh. Thanks for laughing at my jokes. Have a good night. Throughout our whole tour in 2008 in Iraq, he caught everything I ever threw. You know, if you're throwing a water bottle to somebody and they catch it, or you know, you're throwing something like you know, just a football around, or you're, you were sitting there prepping demo, I throw him a stick of C4 over. So I'm sure if he was here today, you know, if I threw this water bottle, you know, he would just kind of, you know, just knowing him and his superhuman abilities, be able to catch this. Uh, just in case I ever become famous. It's my money maker, it really is. Yeah, as long as that wasn't in there, we're fine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you didn't mess this up, it's okay. But before my injury, uh, I like to, uh, I like to, I like to go to the gym a lot, and, uh, has anybody else ever walked into the locker room and gone, hey, oh, woohoo, <laughs> put some pants on. My latest joke is that I'll be sitting up. I'll be sitting up like this. And I'll lean back. Like this. I'm like, oh! My legs are stuck. <laughs> <laughs>